Hello again, folks. This is lecture 33, part four of chapter 26. We're picking up where we left off last time. Uh, we had talked about this sequence of amino acids listed from N terminus over here to C terminus over here. And we had noted that the sequence consists of two overlapping patterns of nonpolar amino acids. Uh, in orange are uh, nonpolar amino acids that repeat every seven residues, and in pink are amino acids that repeat nonpolar amino acids that repeat every seven residues. And uh, we had noted that together these two patterns comprise an A, B, C, D, E, F, G repeating sequence, which we're calling a heptad where the A and the D positions are going to be nonpolar amino acids, respectively. So in this sequence, we have highlighted in orange all the A position nonpolar amino acids. And in pink, we have highlighted all of the D position nonpolar amino acids. And uh, last time we talked about how the hydrophobic effect provides the driving force to sequester nonpolar residues from solvent, and this effect is entropically favorable because it releases the rigid ice-like cage of water molecules that would surround nonpolar residues in the unfolded peptide or protein releases those water molecules to the bulk solvent. Um, so how might this sequence fold up to sequester its nonpolar residues from solvent? Is there uh, some set of rules that might govern that process? Uh, and if so, what is it? So let's talk about what some of the options for folding R for this sequence and see whether any of them uh, lead to a structure that could sequester nonpolar residues from solvent. Uh, one option is the alpha helix. So I've shown you here uh, a backbone diagram of an alpha helix. Uh, and I will label, let's see, this is as good a place as any, amide nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon. <clears throat> uh, the oxygens are, and carbonyl oxygen, the oxygens are red, carbons are yellow, and nitrogens are blue. And uh, you can see that this repeating pattern of nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon, uh, continues to spiral up around itself. So if we call this uh, amino acid here the I position, then the next amino acid with amide nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon, and oxygen, this would be the I plus one amino acid uh, relative to the I position amino acid that we labeled below in black. Then let's maybe uh, choose, I don't know, dark green, amide nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon, and oxygen. We would call this the I plus two amino acid relative to our um, starting amino acid in black. Then let's choose maybe orange for amide nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon, and oxygen. We'll call that I plus three. And then sort of swinging back around, and let's go with, I don't know, purple, amide nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon, and oxygen. And we would call that I plus four. All right. <clears throat> uh, 
and you can see that these residues spiral around each other so that by the time we get to the I plus 4 residue, we've basically gone around one helical turn. It turns out that in the alpha helix there are 3.6 amino acids per turn. And uh, this arrangement allows uh, hydrogen bonding between the uh, amide nitrogen of the I plus 4 position with the carbonyl oxygen of the I position. So um, in crystal structures, uh, we don't see hydrogens, and that's why there are no protons on these amide nitrogens. Nevertheless, we can infer that one is there, and if it were, it would be in between this amide nitrogen and the carbonyl oxygen. So we can use a dotted black line to indicate the hydrogen bond between the amide nitrogen of the I plus 4 residue and the carbonyl oxygen of the um, I position residue. And in general, each carbonyl oxygen hydrogen bonds with an amide proton that is four residues further on in the sequence. So uh, the carbonyl oxygen here is going to be hydrogen bonded to the amide nitrogen there. Uh, carbonyl oxygen in pink is going to be hydrogen bonded to the amide nitrogen there. And so on down through the entire sequence. And it is this pattern of hydrogen bonds that defines what the alpha helix is. Now, 3.6 amino acids per turn is an interesting number because if you did two turns would have 7.2 amino acids in them. And if you tightened up the helix just a bit to 3.5 amino acids per turn, then you would have 7 amino acids per two turns. That is one heptad every, if, and if you were to put our heptides, a heptad sequence within an alpha helix, one heptad would fit within every two turns. So let me show you a model, a, a figure that's a, a model of that situation and what it means for the amino acids that are displayed around the helix. Here is our sequence again uh, with A position amino acids in our heptads labeled in orange, D position amino acids in our heptads are labeled in pink. And uh, then over here, I'm showing you the view down the helical axis, uh, showing you where the side chains would be projected in an alpha helix that has, that's tightened up to have 3.5 amino acids per turn. We're looking uh, down the helical axis at two turns and therefore seven residues. And uh, one of the things that we see if we uh, look at the amino acids that are displayed around this alpha helix is that uh, 
the seven amino acids that are displayed here, we go from A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E, E to F, and then F to G. And after that, we would go back to A, uh, and another A position amino acid would be, would be here. But one of the things that this tells us is if we arrange our heptad sequence in an alpha helical shape, the nonpolar amino acids line up on one face of the helix. In other words, if we superimpose our heptad sequence on an alpha helix, we're going to see that the A and the D positions line up by each other. That's going to be important. Um, we can highlight this finding by taking the whole amino acid sequence um, of our peptide, which happens to be called GCN4P1. Uh, this is the, the sequence we've been talking about the whole time. And starting with orange methionine at, uh, at an A position, uh, we put each amino acid where it would go as displayed around the alpha helix. So A position methionine is here, then B position lysine is here, then C position uh, glutamate, or I'm sorry, glutamine is here. Then D position leucine is here. And then we'd go down, and that would complete two turns of the helix. Um, so A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E, and E to F. And then having uh, completed those two turns of the helix, we would start again. Um, e to F, and sorry, F to G. And having completed those two turns of the helix, we would continue on with the next heptad. Uh, so this is heptad one. This would be heptad Two, so we would start at A position valine to B position glutamate to C position glutamate to D position leucine to E position leucine to F position serine to G position lysine. And that would be the second heptad, and so on. And if we continue to do this down the helix, what we see, oops, didn't want to erase all of that. If we continue to do this down the helix, what we see is a helix that has um, one face that is nonpolar, whereas the other face is polar. If we folded this sequence up into an alpha helix, we would have a sequence, we would have a structure that was what we will call globally amphipathic. 
Ampha means both. Pathic means loving. Globally, amphipathic means we have a helix where on one side, all the way down the helix, we have a nonpolar character. And on the other side of the helix, uh, we have a polar character. Now, here's the jump. We know that nonpolar residues need to be sequestered from water. And the question we could ask is, what if we lined up two of these helices together with their nonpolar with their nonpolar faces interacting with each other? Would that successively bury the nonpolar residues from solvent? And the answer is yes. And uh, it turns out that sequences with this characteristic heptad repeat tend to form alpha helices, and then those alpha helices interact with each other. This particular sequence forms what we call a coiled coil dimer, uh, in which two alpha helices associate. And you can see here, these are the A plus D position residues, the A plus D face of each helix is packing against uh, the A plus D face of the other helix, burying those nonpolar uh, amino acid residues from solvent. And this uh, sequence was known from a yeast transcription factor uh, and was characterized to be in this coil-coil conformation by X-ray crystallography uh, published in the journal Science in 1991. Um, and so for a bit of fun, I'm going to pause so I can start recording my computer screen because I want to take you to PyMole and give you a tour through the coil-coil sequence uh, so that you can see how the A and D faces uh, interact with each other and are sequestered from solvent. All right, so here we're within the program PyMole looking uh, down the interface between two helices, uh, two copies of the GCN4 peptide that we were just talking about, and uh, the interface between the two helices is where the A and D position residues are. We're looking uh, down this structure from its end terminus. If we look at it from the side, we can see uh, another way, uh, from another view, the helices sort of uh, wrapping around and binding to each other. I'm going to label the A and D positions of the helix in uh, different colors. Uh, but I'll point out first that this is a ribbon diagram, and the cartoon traces the trajectory of the backbone atoms amide nitrogen, alpha carbon, and carbonyl carbon as you go down the helix. Uh, so I'm going to label the A positions in uh, orange. And I'm going to label the D positions with bright pink. And if we look at this from the side, you can see how uh, the orange A positions and pink D positions are all at the interface between the two helices. Now, uh, let's make this just a little bit more complicated by showing you the side chains that are at this interface. So in orange are the A position side chains. And you can see at the interface between the two helices, uh, A position methionine uh, 2 is lined up with A position methionine 2 on the other helix. Um, let's now show the D position amino acids and you can see all the way down the helix that one deposition amino acid is paired at the interface with another deposition amino acid on the other helix. 
So for example, here you have uh, leucine 5 on one helix interacting with leucine 5 on the other helix. Um, we can see these interactions a little bit more closely uh, by looking at a cross-section of the coil coil or helix bundle focusing in on the interface. <clears throat> and just to give you a sense for how the hydrophobic packing is occurring, uh, let's see, show side chain spheres. Gonna add hydrogens. We're going to hide hydrogens. And then we're going to show side chain spheres. And we'll do that for the D position as well. Sorry, these are just technical issues that you don't need to worry about. All right, so here we see residue 2 methionine uh, at an A position. And those two amino acids are packing against each other, but perhaps not that tightly. Uh, this sort of makes sense because the helices get a little looser towards their uh, N and C termini, respectively. But if we continue moving down the helix, we can see the two uh, D position leucine fives. They are pink and they are at a D position. I'm going to make the space filling spheres a little more transparent to just give you a hint of the way the two residues are contacting each other. They are within van der Waals uh, radius of each other. They're making contact and there's definitely some van der Waals interactions going on. But again, remember the thing that's uh, driving this folding is the fact that these nonpolar side chains are sequestered from solvent. So we saw an A position methionine 2. We saw D position leucine 5. Uh, next in the core should be a position valine, what does it look like? Six, seven, eight, nine. So we'll zoom through and there's the amino acid valine uh, packing against itself. Uh, if you compare valine nine at a D position, I'm gonna get that wrong, I'm sorry. If you compare orange valine nine, which is at an A position, with the previous leucine 5 at a D position, you can see a, an interesting difference, at least in the sequence. At D position uh, 5, we have a leucine in which there is no branching at the beta carbon that I'm pointing to here. However, at orange A position valine 10, there is beta branching. Uh, valine has two methyl groups attached to the beta carbon. We call it a beta branched amino acid. And as we look through most of the A and D positions, we'll see that D positions are not beta branched in this coil coil dimer, whereas A positions are beta branched. Here's another non beta branched D position. Uh, here's another beta branched A position. Here's another non beta branched D position. Uh, one of the things you may have noticed from this sequence is that A position asparagine 16 is a polar amino acid that occupies a position within the nonpolar core of this coil coil dimer. And you may wonder what's going on. Uh, it turns out that uh, here is the amide nitrogen from one asparagine. Here is the carbonyl oxygen from the other asparagine, and we can actually measure the distance between those two amino acids. It's about 2.6 angstroms, which actually is shorter than the uh, van der Waal radii of nitrogen plus hydrogen uh, plus oxygen, <clears throat> suggesting that there's actually a strong hydrogen bond 
uh, occurring between these two amino acids. Uh, and there's some speculation that this hydrogen bond provides uh, some of the specificity for this sequence to adopt a dimer association state. Um, but with that, that is our tour through the GCN4 sequence. I will just point out, um, and we'll go ahead and hide the spheres for clarity, um, that, as we've said, the A and the G position, I'm sorry, the A and the D positions are at the, uh, in, on the along the nonpolar surface in the core of this uh, coil coil. One of the interesting things you may note is that positions E and G within the heptad, I'm going to label E as cyan. Let's see, E is cyan and G is going to be, I don't know, green. <laughs> um, if we, and I'm going to hide the side chains to make this clearer. Um, one of the things you will note looking down the interface between the two helices is that you have the pink D position and the orange A position. The orange A position is flanked by the green <clears throat> uh, by the green G position. This is G from the previous heptad and then this is A from the next heptad. Uh, similarly, the D positions are flanked by blue E positions. So these so-called E and G position amino acids occupy <clears throat> uh, sort of flanking positions along the hydrophobic core. And we can show you some of these E and G position amino acids. We'll just show the sticks, but we'll hide the hydrogens. And we'll show the sticks. There we go. Uh, you can see that many of these amino acids that flank the nonpolar core uh, have methylene groups uh, that can pack against the nonpolar core, but also have charges. So uh, one interesting example is here where green G position lysine 15 uh, is fairly close to blue E position glutamate 20 in what we might consider to be a salt bridge. They're 6.2 angstroms apart, which is perhaps close enough for an interaction. Uh, alternatively, we might note that G position glutamate 22 and E position lysine 27 are even closer to each other. Uh, let's see. Uh, across the interface between the coil coils, about 3.6 angstroms, which is definitely close enough for a salt bridge interaction. So uh, in general, what we will see is that residues that f the E and G position residues that flank the interface are frequently charged and engage in uh, salt bridges across the helical interface. Um, with that, we'll pause and go back to um, notability uh, so that we can talk about a minor sequence change that has a dramatic impact on the structure and folding of this peptide. Again, the key features to remember but we want to hide the hydrogens, is that um, nonpolar amino acids uh, 
at um, A and D positions are sequestered at the interface between the two helices where they're buried from solvent. And so the alpha helical structure will take this sequence we've been looking at and uh, and if each if one peptide binds to another in this coil coil dimer all of the nonpolar residues at a and d positions can be sequestered from solvent okay we've just been through a tour in pymol of the structure of the coiled coil dimer formed by gcn4 it looked something like this, we've seen that the A and D position residues were sequestered at the interface between the two helices where they could be away from solvent. We also made the interesting observation <clears throat> that many of the A position amino acids in this dimer were beta branched, whereas none of the amino acids at the D position were beta branched. All right. Um, we're going to talk now about how a minor sequence change at this nonpolar interface can change whether this peptide forms a coil coil dimer or a coil coil tetramer. So Actually, there are a number of coil-coil oligomerization states known. The dimer you have already seen, uh, depending on sequence, you might get a trimer. And again, the interior of the trimer are going to be A and D positions. Same in the tetramer. Uh, and we're going to see that modest sequence changes are what uh, allow us to distinguish between dimer and tetramer and even trimer, uh, with more uh, extensive modifications, though, chemists are now able to engineer coil coils that are much higher order oligomers, including a pentamer and a heptamer. But we're going to focus our discussion today on the difference between this dimer and the tetramer. And this is to illustrate the principle that sequence an amino acid structure influences the way a protein folds. And then you will learn in biochemistry that the way a protein folds is intimately connected with its function. So um, here is the sequence of the GCN4PLI tetramer. It's identical to the sequence for the GCN4P1 uh, peptide except in every place uh, let's see so I'll just write GCN4 P1 and I'll just write here that in GCN4 P1 this D position was a leucine all of the D positions were leucines uh, and that the A positions in many cases were beta branched Let me just check and make sure that's correct. Okay. So by this subtle modification, valine to leucine, at, uh, putting uh, at A positions instead of beta branched residues at A positions, we now have non-beta branched amino acids, whereas at the pink D positions, we now have beta branched. That's a switch from our sequence from the GCN4P1 dimer, where all of the D positions were non-beta branched and uh, many of the A positions were beta branched.
Okay. And uh, when uh, Professor Kim and others made these changes to the sequence of the GCN4 peptide, they noticed something dramatic in the crystal structure. It was no longer a dimer, but was a tetramer. Here you see a helix bundle tetramer in which there are four helices packing against each other. And they pack against each other in a parallel way. That is, their N termini are lined up and their C termini are lined up. Also note that none of the other residues along the uh, polar face of the helix change. These are the same as in GCN4P1. All we did was change the amino acids at the non-polar face, and it had a dramatic consequence. So now we're going to pause and go to PyMol, uh, where I can take you on a tour through this uh, tetramer sequence, or rather the structure of the tetramer sequence. All right, here we are back in PyMol looking at the uh, GCN4PLI tetramer. We've just described the sequence where the D position amino acids are now beta branched and the A position amino acids are non beta branched. And we described how that switch changed uh, the association state of this peptide from a dimer to a tetramer. So here is the ribbon diagram of the tetramer. You can see four helices uh, wrapped around each other about a central axis. If we look down the axis of the helix bundle, sort of right here around which these helices are rotating, uh, we're looking down the, the coil coil from the N terminus. And uh, again, we will see that it's nonpolar residues buried in the interior that are going to be sequestered from solvent and it's going to provide the driving force for folding. So as we did last time, I'm going to color the A position residues as orange and the D position residues as bright pink. You can see that those A and D position residues are all at the interface between the helices. Uh, again, we'll take the view looking straight down the helix bundle from the N terminus. And I will show now uh, the A position side chains. Uh, now, at the coiled coil interface, instead of there being two A position side chains packed against each other, there are now four. So here we have the four A position methionine 2 amino acids packed against each other in the core. Um, it may be useful at this time to um, let's see, sorry. Let's do show side chain sticks. I want to show the space filling spheres, um, so give me just a second to get that set up. All right, so here we're looking at the four methionine, A position methionine, two uh, amino acids in, in cross section. You can see them packed against each other and sequestered from solvent. Uh, if we start to move down the helix bundle, we come across D position isoleucine five. 
and the beta branching you can see actually allows these um, isoleucine residues to completely fill up the space inside the tetramer. Uh, if this amino acid were leucine, the methyl group here would be gone and there would be a methyl group out here and there would be space left inside the tetramer. So it turns out that having beta branching at a D position is totally compatible with um, forming a tetramer. We'll continue on now and look at A position leucine 9. And um, we'll see that at this A position, if we were to have beta branching, it would be in the tetramer, if we were to have beta branching, the methyl group would be pointing out this way. It would be wasted. It would be pointing out away from the space between the two, that was between the four helices. And so it turns out that non-beta branched residues fit perfectly at an A position within the tetramer and do a good job of filling up that space. And so we can continue if we look at uh, D position isoleucine 12 we'll find again that the beta branched methyl group uh, points back into the interface between the helices and fills that space, uh, but that uh, beta, bran beta branching would be wasted on D position leucine 16. And so we alternate going down the core between A position isoleucine residues and D position leucine residues. Um, but you can see in each case what we're doing is protecting, by forming the tetramer, we're protecting nonpolar surface area from being exposed to water. Um, I will point out that as in the dimer, E and G position residues flank the interface uh, between the helices, and in many cases there are interhelical interactions that can uh, provide some uh, stabilization to the helix bundle tetramer. I will color the E positions cyan and I will color the G positions green for G um, and then you will see as we look down the helix and we can actually do this in cross-section one turn at a time. Uh, A positions are flanked by green G position residues, whereas D positions are flanked by cyan E position residues. So E and G flank the interface. Um, I'm going to hide spheres and hide sticks at the A and D positions. Hmm. All right, and I will show side chain sticks at E and G positions. Only for detail, I wanna hide those hydrogens. In fact, we'll just remove the hydrogens. Okay, so as we look down uh, the helix, we can see a number of situations in which uh, green G position charge residues are interacting with uh, blue E position residues. For example, lysine 15 of G position appears to be very close uh, to glutamate, G position glutamate 20. And if we measured the distance between the two, ta -ta -ta, first atom, we'll choose the lysine ammonium group, yeah, we're only two angstroms apart. So that's a very close, probably a very stable salt bridge. Similarly, 
we see that these two residues, green G position glutamate 22, is interacting uh, closely with blue G position, a uh, blue E position lysine 27. And we would call these salt bridges. Uh, if we look a little bit further down the helix, we can see and a G position arginine, and we can do the measurement here again, a G position arginine very close within three angstroms of G position arginine one within three angstroms of E position glutamate six on another helix. Um, and this is typical of helix bundles. You will see the nonpolar core sequestered from solvent and then at the interface between the helices, sort of solvent exposed. Sorry for the notification, that's my sister-in-law. So we'll just go ahead and say that that's red. Uh, anyway, sorry about that. My sister and sister and brother-in-law, well, Amber's brother and his wife are expecting a little boy, and so we're getting ultrasound pictures. And the text said that cousin or that Amber's brother Tim is sewing something for the baby. Good boy. Um, all right. So you've seen how a subtle change in the shape of the amino acids at the interface between helices uh, can cause a dramatic change in how the peptide folds. This is an example of the principle or the connection between uh, sequence, structure, and ultimately function. All right, lastly, I want to tell you a final story about an interesting relationship between sequence, uh, structure, and function. And this is the story of the antimicrobial host defense peptides. Many different organisms uh, secrete uh, peptides that kill bacteria um, and other organisms as a mechanism for defense. Uh, I suppose you could describe this as part of the innate immune response. Um, years ago, in the mid-80s, uh, scientists isolated the peptide meganin-2 from the African claw frog, and it was secreted from the frog skin. They named it after the Hebrew word for shield, and uh, the role of this peptide appears to be to kill bacteria uh, that would otherwise infect the frog. And uh, the mechanism of function of this peptide is actually pretty well understood. Here is the amino acid sequence. And uh, you can see that there are, and I guess I'll color them in green, a number of non-polar amino acids throughout this sequence, isoleucine, phenylalanine, leucine, another phenylalanine, phenylalanine, valine, isoleucine, methionine. And <clears throat> it turns out that this peptide is unstructured when on its own in solution, but as it approaches uh, the membrane of a bacterial cell, uh, it adopts an alpha helical conformation. And what I'm showing you here is a helical wheel diagram similar to the one we saw before for coil coils, only this uh, helical wheel diagram is based on the idea of 3.6 residues per turn. So it would actually take you uh, 10 turns to get or uh, it would take you 18 turns to get right back where you were uh, at the beginning. In any case, 
um, when this peptide folds into a helical conformation, you can see that the nonpolar residues highlighted in green, and the greener they are, the more nonpolar they are, are all sequestered along one face of the helix, whereas the polar residues are on the opposite face, and many of these polar residues are positively charged. And if you <clears throat> and what's uh, known about this peptide is that it can lyse the membrane of bacteria. And its ability to do this has to do with the fact that when it's in this alpha helical conformation, it is globally amphipathic. That is, it has a positively charged face and a nonpolar surface. And this is important uh, for its function because, of course, the bacterial phospholipid bilayer has negatively charged head groups and nonpolar tails in the interior. And it's thought that the peptide inserts itself into the membrane by having its polar face interact with the negatively charged head groups and its nonpolar face interact with the nonpolar tails. So here is a, a cartoon of what membrane insertion might look like for this Meganin peptide. And uh, here, let's see, maybe I'll highlight it in gray. Here would be the nonpolar face of Meganin interacting with the lipid. Uh, Non, the, the nonpolar tails of the lipid bilayer. And then on this surface, you have the polar residues interacting with the polar head groups of the bilayer. Uh, and it's thought that if you get enough of these peptides on the surface of a bacterial cell, they can insert into the membrane and create a hole uh, called a toroidal pore, somewhat donut shaped. And, and uh, shown here is uh, an image from a simulation of how uh, these globally amphipathic helices might open up pores in bacterial membranes with the nonpolar tails shown in gray and the polar head groups shown in yellow. Um, so uh, like the helix bundles, this is an example of a peptide whose sequence and structure are related to its function, that when this peptide adopts an alpha helical structure, the nonpolar surface on one side of the alpha helix enables this peptide to insert into bacterial membranes, open up a pore, and then of course that kills bacteria because their guts go spewing out the hole. Um, and with that graphic image in mind, that will end today's lecture. And uh, we'll pick up next time with a discussion of how you synthesize peptides using chemistry.